And today my topic is presenting a new navigation jam in the engine. And in the last year or so, I worked uh, on introducing a new navigation logic to the engine. And so here's my agenda for the uh, current presentation. First, I will start with the theoretical part, describing what, like, the basic idea, what navigation is, how it's being used, um, where the new gem is, so how to use it. And I'll do a um, quick demo to show you actually using the engine. And I'll get back and I'll show discuss what's currently in the gem and what could be, what's possible to add in the future. So beginning, we can start with the definition of navigation gem is this. And it's basically a type of data structure that records uh, paths in the area that are walkable versus not walkable. Um, and there are many uses for that. Uh, for example, you could use it for navigate your own player or move a non-playable character um, there's also, if you have a number of uh, agents together, you can have them work as well. There's other cases, like you can, for example, aside from doing a ray cast in graphical, you can also cast like on a pathable path. Um, other things you could do is um, to find a nearby walkable point as well. But the basic use case is to really just find the path. For example, in this case, you will find the path from a ledge cylinder to some particular spot elsewhere, and they would do it while avoiding any obstacles as defined. Another fun use case is specifically crowd navigation where not only are you following a particular object, but you want multiple agents to follow that object without colliding with each other. Um, but before I get into showing what, um, how to use navigation, I want to cover a little bit behind the scenes what's going on when you compute navigation mesh from scratch. So let's imagine we have a new, some kind of level. Level design, we have some particular geometry here and there. Um, now what will happen is that uh, the code behind the scenes will go through and turn the whole world uh, into particular small voxels, which is a small unit of space, and then you would go through to decide if a particular triangle for your scene is there or not. So, as you think about that, you have to consider that how many objects in a scene do you have? Because the more triangles, the more objects you have, the longer it takes to go from them all and compute which voxels are open and which ones are not. Aside from that, you model also can compute if there are any walkable paths depending on the height of your agent. For example, the blue boxes represent the walkable paths, versus the darker ones indicate that there's the height there is not big enough for your character, which is configurable. And after that, the whole area is broken down into parts, um, just for scalability, and you define uh, what are the links between those, those paths. So that you try, if, you, if you're looking for a path from beginning to end across them, you would use this connectivity idea to go a bit across them all. Now in the end, it will be formed into this particular convex series of uh, flat, flat planes in a way. In this case, the blue area is, defines what is the workable path and if an else is not. So likewise, let's say you have a beginning point somewhere in the bottom, in this case it's the red cylinder, and towards the end, what it would do, it traverse your data structure and it would find the shortest path across the, the areas. Now, so in my case, my work, I did not write all this code from scratch, I used an existing library. And this library has been used a number of different projects, um, it's used a number of different engines. It's been proven to uh, be stable, a great library for quite a while. The original author, I believe, is Miko Mononen. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. But it's been available for GitHub for a while. Um, and this provides both computation for the navigation area plus all the pathing logic on top of that. Um, so the gem that I wrote, it pulls down uh, GitHub source code from this library and then encapsulates that in a number of Lombo no, number of open 3D components on top of that. And so these, this library forms the basis for the new gem that you can build on top of that as well inside open 3D. So the current release 2210, a new gem called Recast Navigation Gem is included. It's the same license as O3D, and Recast Library is compatible license with O3D as well. And so with that, you will have the starting building blocks to producing navigation logic for the project. Alongside of the project, I wanted to show how to use it. Uh, and so 
I built a new sample level in the existing project. Uh, automated testing project comes shipped with the engine. So if you open up a project, you'll see a sample level uh, and it will show you the use of this engine. I will show that at the end of my demo. So before I go through the demo, video of the demo, I want to go through some of the uh, basic components that involved in the gem to kind of show you the general structure of the layout. Um, so in the beginning, it was really just three components to help you define what the area you want to compute navigation mesh for. So first one is a request navigation mesh. Now that's just the core itself, the one that will have the final data. But it requires a number of components after that. Specific and next one is a provider component. That one collects triangle data from a, from a scene and passes it to a navigation gem, a navigation mesh component rather. So this, so this these components are replaceable, so if you wanted to, you could replace this provider component with one of your own. This one particularly goes into physics world, it queries for any physics geometry, and then passes it back. And the last one here is the one that defines the area. This is the kind of the way it defines your world area, it tells you, which lets you configure the size of a navigation map that you would want. So if you have a particular size of the map, you'd want to cover what area you, want, you need. And depending on the scale, that will uh, affect both the runtime, computation, and the memory use as well. So just to do it again in the visual form, there's three components involved here. Uh, the first one on the, on the, on the left, axis align, that's an existing component that I'm just reusing to define an area. The recast behind the scenes only supports like rectangular box-like area in the world, and so that's what I'm starting from. And that tells the provider component where to look for geometry. So in this case, it's physics, so the specific geometry. And that finally feeds into the, uh, the component that will do the real work of computing all the data for you. One of the things is that the gem has um, a live preview in the editor. So for example, these are two screenshots from the editor where you have a live preview of the navigation mesh and without. So at the top of the one, there is no preview, and then there is a little bit colored grayed out layover to indicate where the walkable paths are. Likewise, when you run in a game, you can have the same data shown to you as well. So in this case, the red cylinder is your player object, and little purple area overlaid in different boxes and tells you the, uh, the walkable path areas. Now that just builds you the navigational data. The next part is to how to use it. That brings us to one additional component, which is a detour navigation component. Now request navigation component is the one that computes the area, but then there's a separate API that allows you to query for a particular API between two points or between two entities. Um, so data flow here, you we would use a detour component and then they would query underneath. And there's both for C++ and uh, scripting API as well. For example, this is script canvas nodes that allows you to um, uh, query the gem to tell it to update navigation map mesh over the area. And you can do it both in a blocking way where you block the thread until it's done, or you can do it in async and it'll give you a notification back when it's done. Likewise, to find the path, there, is, uh, there are three canvas nodes and uh, same way access to Lua and C++ that allows you to find the path between either two positions or between two entities. And the entities is kind of helper wrappers that will just poke at the entities and ask them what their current positions are. So let me now jump into, uh, into demo itself. Now in the interest of time, I've recorded myself during the demo. So I'm just gonna be playing the video as I talk over it. So in this case, I'm starting completely from scratch. So I'm starting a brand new level. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not actually showing up. Let me close. Restart. Hmm. I don't think it's broadcasting the video. I think it's only broadcasting the slides. Oh, 
figure it out. It seems like it shows, uh, I need to show the video, not the, sli not the slides. And it seems- If you exit your slide, you're duplicating your screen, I think. Hmm. Are you extended desktop? Let me see. Let me try to duplicate. Yeah, if you duplicate play it on the center, it'll be on both. Okay, cool. Yep. Excellent. All right. So this is the uh, recording of the demo. So I'm starting a brand new level from scratch inside the engine. I'm giving it some particular name. Um, in this case, you're going to get a starting beginning level. So the first thing I'm going to need is to define a new entity which will contain all the navigation mesh logic. So here's an entity. Let's call it some kind of navigation mesh, and we'll. Uh, Go by search by searching for recast components. So the first one we can use is to start with a recast navigation mesh component. And that one will ask you to add all requirement or requirement or required required components as you need to. So provider again provides you all the all the uh, triangle data. And you can see there you can even provide a collision group as well. And the access align box shape tells you allows you to define the size of the compute navigation area over. In this case it's this yellow area. Now, by default, the editor preview is off, and there was a little toggle which allows you to enable it. And when I do that here, you will notice that there is a create over area. And that tells you that navigational data is already being computed over that space. So now to test it out, I'm going to add some obstacles to it. Now, all we really need to do is add some collider uh, component into a separate entity. In this case, it could be a box of anything. Now, it's updated about once a second, and once the dimensions are big enough, it will be detected and the area will be updated. And you can either change the shape or you can just scale out the whole entity. And you notice that now that there is white space around that box and it tells you that path is, uh, that area is no longer walkable. And we can add some visualization just to help us. Now I'm gonna prepare the key of the valve well now a little bit just to clean it up so it's easy to see uh, once we start beginning to commit the path. So for example, I want to remove the, uh, the, the grid out texture. I want to remove the grid so that I can see any kind of lines much easier. And also hide the shadable as well. All right, so now that every, now everything's cleaned up, one of the things that we can do is that we can actually see that the navigation mesh is updated in real time. This is inside the editor, not in game mode. Um, and again, can all be, can be controlled uh, using that editor preview switch. Aside from that, we can also, let's say, if we duplicate this uh, entity, it will update it as well in real time. This way you don't need to enter your game mode to try to guess if you got the right results or not. You can just see it immediately. Anyway. So here I'm just moving the camera so it's so, uh, some more usable positions, we're gonna start going into game mode. Now by default, if you go to game mode, you're not actually computing a navigation mesh at all yet. Because by default, the navigation mesh is waiting for you to ask it to compute the area when you're in the game mode. So we're just gonna create a quick little script that's gonna do just that. So I'm gonna jump into the script canvas. And here we need uh, really just one node um, but first, we're going to do it on the, when the entity activates itself. Additionally, I, don't, I want to make sure all the objects are alive by the time I'm, I'm uh, computing the area, so I'm going to delay it by a few ticks. And for that, I'm just using time delay node. And then finally, the real node we care about is the update navigation mesh here. And just, that's really just about that. So when, I, when entity gets activated and a few ticks are gone past, gone past we tell it to update navigation mesh. So now I'm just gonna save the script to some location in the project. 
This is an on-site automated testing project for reference, but it could be anywhere. And so now once the script is saved, now I will go back to the editor and assign it to the script canvas component. Um, no. So in this particular case, this is the same entity that contains recast navigation mesh component. Uh, so it will invoke the API using the same entity. Now to see the preview in the game, we have to use debug draw switch. So now when we enter game mode, we can see the grid area, just like we have seen before in the editor preview. So that's the game mode switch. So two switches, debug draw is for the game mode preview and the editor preview for the, for the in editor preview. Now in this particular case, for the rest of the demo, I'm just gonna keep have both of them on, but just to show they can control that. So now that we have, uh, have computed the path, let's show you how to find, once we computed the meshes, we can, we can show you how to find the paths. So I'm gonna create, create two entities. There's gonna be from and to, essentially. Um, now mesh is kind of optional, it's just gonna visually show us what's going on here. And I'm gonna create a cylinder in one part and a red, uh, Ball, ball, another one. I'm going to compute paths between them. So here's a cylinder. Um, in this case, I'm just creating a child entity, but it's kind of optional. It doesn't have to be in any particular configuration. And so for the goal entity, I'm again, I'm adding a mesh component. In this case, I think I'm choosing a sphere a model at the end here. I'm going to make it mark it red as well. And to find the paths, what we'll need is a detour component. So again, we go back to one of the entities. Um, and I'm gonna add a detour component. Now, a detour component needs to reference the navigation mesh component, which kind of lives on a different entity. That's why you would use navigation mesh property to tell it which entity has the navigational mesh data. So your detail component can be used with a number of meshes, so you can have multiple meshes in your, in your level. So now a detail component, detail component has a connection to the uh, navigation mesh, but now we need to actually have some kind of logic code to update and ask to find the paths. So here, um, I'm gonna build a quick real script, which will, every tick, it will ask for a position between two entities. Now in this case, we're going from the current entity to the goal entity. So for that, I need an additional canvas property for the uh, goal entity. So here I'm getting from the goal, I'm passing that into the find path entity um, node. So now we're going from self from the current entity towards the goal entity. Uh, now by default, that doesn't draw much on its own. Um, but I think it kind of gets us started. So for now, I'm just saving the script. And what I want to do is I go, want to go back to the editor and actually set this parameter to be the other goal entity because the script itself needs that information from the component. Now in this particular case in this uh, presentation, I forgot to do a flip a little switch, maybe not. Yeah, I forgot to do the flip little switch in the, in the screen this property where you need to tell that, that the value comes from the component. So you go, I'm going to go and tell it to get the initial value from the component. And so now if I'm gonna save it and go back to the editor, now the variable goal shows up and I'm dragging and dropping the goal entity. So now the script has enough information for us to find the path between two points. Now, here we're just gonna use uh, more script canvas nodes will let you iterate from all the waypoints. And waypoints are just a position in the world that tells you the path from beginning to end, or maybe more than one of them, just depending on how complicated the path is. So these results really just um, can exist on the canvas nodes. There's nothing specific to request navigation mesh here. And I'm using debug draw jam, which is draw line location to location. I'm just choosing some red color. And I need to do the additional parameter here because I'm drawing between two points in this, in this loop. I need to save the previous point as I'm drawing through it. So that's why I created a new parameter. I would call it previous. And so as I'm drawing lines, I'm gonna save it and, and use it as, for each call. So for each canvas, keep on this node goes over each waypoint and I'm saving this current waypoint to the previous so that the next iteration I can draw the line from the next one and so on. 
That's basically it. That will let us draw. And this should let us draw a red line between the two entities. Now, this happens in the game mode, not in editor mode, so we do need to go into in game mode. Now, you can see it draws a pad, but there is one little glitch there where it just draws a line straight to the box. It's actually a little bug in the free canvas code I had. And so what I needed to do was to reset the previous value when the loop is done, because otherwise I'm, I'm drawing the line back from the endpoint to the beginning, which is why it makes it odd. So all we need to do is I just need to um, get the current position of the current entity and just kind of reinitialize the previous value. So now when everything is done from that finish node, I'm just gonna update the previous value. So now when you go into game mode, we'll get a nice red line that goes from beginning to end. And because it computes every tick, or every go, we can just move uh, the child entity somewhere else and then enter again the game mode, and you will see the path will update itself. And that's the gist of it. Now the last thing I wanted to show is the car navigation symbol that comes built into the engine already. And just like the one demo seems so far, this one only uses the view, script canvas nodes. And so again, if you have automated testing project enabled, you go to the navigation sample folder. And here I have a level that I've built out when I was testing this. So in this case, I've built a level, kind of simulates some like a, like a long running terrain that's generated at runtime. So that's like one little block and it gets spawned as you enter the game like multiple times in a little line, almost like a long road. And again, it's the same way red cylinders, you use your player object. Um, and once you enter the mode, there's a little mouse and you can uh, hold left uh, button click, and it'll tell you to give you the preview of the path is. Yes. And once you let it go, they'll bring us to move around. And I, I think it's configured behind you how many, how long the block list is. I think I made like maybe like 10 or so, so you can go for quite for a while to it. And one of the key things here is that the whole uh, navigation mesh is computed here at runtime. There's currently no saving feature, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end but that provides you the basic stuff where it's pretty quick to compute as long as the geometry is found reasonable. I even tested it with a terrain, so you can compute a decent amount of data at runtime without any impact. So that's it for the demo. I wanted to finish just a few slides. So this current implementation has the basic features, which is just the navigation computation, the path computation, and allows you to give you access to the, the, on the request library object under the hood so you can build on top of that. Um, and Gem itself is called request navigation. It's shipped as part of the engine. So anytime you download the engine, such as 22, 10 or later, you will see the Gem already there. So they provided the basic stuff. The next things that could be added to the engine um, for example, it would be like crowd navigation where you can have multiple objects uh, going towards one goal, multiple goals without bumping into each other. One thing it's not there yet, but it's supported by recast as uh, obstacle support. Because right now you're defining uh, the positive area where you can go, but additionally it would be nice to be able to say like this part is not passable at all. Whereas right now if you have like, really a large empty volume, it will think that on the outskirts it's not passable, the inside also possible as well. So that would be nice to add. Additional save and load. I did prototype save and load, but I didn't make it in time to add it as a feature. You know. Well, I found that for most levels at a decent scale, you don't really need to compute it pre ahead of time, but it would be nice. It would be a great feature to have for a really large scale. Additional thing that uh, Recast Library supports is to be able to have multiple levels. Like imagine you have this building of multiple floors. Right now, we just, we'll just pick one of the levels of the height but you can actually define multiple levels and define like you can go from this floor to the next one and so on. Right now it's not there, but the, the library under the hood does support it. And also as I was working on this canvas example, I noticed it'd be nice to have some helpful nodes, maybe to draw paths a little faster without having to spend the little seven nodes that I've set up to draw the path. Um, so far I've been able to put the ground navigation on top of that. Um, and even more features are possible as I only begin, begin to explore what uh, features Request Library provides for us. 
And that's all. Thank you, everyone.